Okay, thank you, Bastian. Yeah, I will not have the opportunity to talk about global hydrological modeling per se, but I will focus today on how um, we have used GRACE total water storage anomaly for validating our model and for calibrating our global hydrological model water gap. And I will show you what are the benefits and the limitations, not only, let's say, for our modeling, but for, I think, large scale um, water modeling. So in general, large basins, continents, and uh, the world. So my presentation will start with a short introduction to our global hydrological model water gap. Then I will talk about what are Gray's total water storage anomalies, how do they look like, and what, as I said, limitations they have. And then we'll go more rather into the benefits by showing you how we use uh, the Gray's total water storage anomalies for testing and validating water gap, but also for tuning water gap. And then finally, in the last years, also trying to calibrate water gap by a basin specific multivariable estimation of parameter sets. That means not just using total water storage anomalies, but TWSA and uh, stream flow, and maybe also other uh, remotely sensed parameter um, variables using those. So not just TWSA, but TWSA together with stream flow and others. And of course, I'll end with some conclusions. So it's about benefits of total water storage anomalies from GRACE for global hydrological modeling. And so um, I will introduce our global model water gap that has been it's a, really a legacy code and uh, old model that has been developed for more than 25 years now. And uh, this is a water resources model in the sense that we have um, on the one hand um, water use models that compute um, water use to irrigation, livestock, domestic water use, manufacturing water use, and power use. And then um, the estimates of water use go into, let's say, a coupling model where we say or estimate what part of that water use comes from groundwater and that which part comes from surface water. And then we compute net abstractions from surface water bodies and from groundwater that is the abstraction minus the return flow. And that is then all input to the more specific hydrological model. So the water gap global hydrologic model. And um, that is a model like typical hydrological models where you have a lot of uh, water storage compartments here in the boxes and they have inflows and outflows. It's like ordinary differential equations. And um, what you see here is what happens within a half degree grid cell. So this is the spatial resolution of the model. It has a daily resolution. And we have we compute a vertical water balance. And then also what happens within a cell when then the runoff flows into groundwater and lakes and wetlands and so on. So different storage compartments. And all these, those, not all, but the groundwater, the lakes, and the reservoirs, and the river, they are then um, affected by these net abstractions from surface water or groundwater use. So in such a global modeling, the input data are the most important thing. It's not so much about having beautiful algorithms. So the most important input data for sure are the daily climate variables like precipitation, radiation, uh, temperature. And we have that from 1901 to 2022 in the sense that we can run these time series with observed or observation-based uh, climate input. And then of course we can run a uh, climate change model output. Very important also is where are irrigated areas and what are the source of water because 70% of uh, the total water abstractions worldwide are from uh, irrigation or for irrigation and almost 90% of the water that is consumed, evaporated during use, is also for irrigation. And then, of course, other important uh, physiogeographic inputs are lakes, where are the man-made reservoirs, where are wetlands, how does water flow over the continents, the water capacity in the soil, the land cover. Anyway, so complex model with a lot of input data, but also a lot of parameters that are poorly um, constrained. And so what do we have for constraining? We, I mean, of course, there are many um, things we could, I mean, we could calibrate our model on, but there are only two 
variables that are really integrated variables and are therefore very, very good for um, model calibration or model estimation. And that is a stream flow because it's the stream flow is the flow that then comes out of a cell and flows into the next cell after all these um, flows and storages has been occurred. So that's the one integrative variable, and that is the variable for which observations are used by generally all hydrological models to validate and to calibrate their model. And um, now, but we have with the total water storage anomaly, we have another integrative variable. Why? Because it is the total water storage is the sum of the storage in the river, the wetlands, the lakes, the reservoirs, the groundwater, the soil, the snow, and the canopy. Okay, what is missing in water gap is the glacier. So uh, that is a missing water storage, but for the rest, um, water gap covers all water storages. And so we can, outside of glacierized areas, we can use uh, estimates or observations uh, of total water storage anomaly as they come from GRACE as a way for validating our model. And just to give you an impression of the global rest of the resolution of our model, half degree, what that means is um, here for, for Northern America, no, that this is one tiny grid cell here. And here you see the drainage directions, how let's say precipitation that falls here, how it's then routed along in the Mississippi basin, and then it ends in the ocean. And that's where our model stops. And for example, in, in red, you see the location of stream flow gauge and stations, which is the standard way of calibrating hydrologic models and also our model. So water gap has been, I think, almost the only one model that for many years has been calibrating, has been calibrated against stream flow, but in a very, very simple way. We only look at mean annual stream flow over, let's say, whatever we have on calibration years, ideally 30 calibration years. And then we try to get this uh, mean annual stream flow right within at least 10% by adjusting one model parameter. And if necessary, and it's necessary often, um, one or two correction factors. And we do that for each, uh, um, each of the calibration units. And currently we have uh, 1,509 calibration units. And these are always the basins upstream of a stream flow gauging station. And they are, are a minimum, they have a minimum of about 20,000 square kilometers, but they can be um, much larger. No, I mean, as you see here in the Nile, for example, you have large basins. And when you're here in Germany or Northern uh, North America, it's smaller basins. And in this map, you see what we have as stream flow observations available. You see here the number of calibration years that are available if we look at the time period 1979 and 30 years later. And what you notice is not ideally we would have 30 years, so blue, but there are many areas with less uh, number of uh, years available. And those, but it says no, not used means we have to go before 1979 for uh, calibration. Anyway. Here, this is how currently water gap is calibrated. And we decided not to adjust for more parameters because of the problem of equifinality, but also the calibration effort. Equifinality means that if you just use stream flow, um, you can adjust many parameters in a very, I mean, you can have the same output more or less with a very diverse uh, group of parameter um, sets. So um, that's why normally one says, OK, we need to have more observations and ideally of a different variable to be better able to calibrate um, a hydrologic model. And this is where Gray's total water storage anomaly comes in. Because then all of a sudden we have, with Gray's, not all of a sudden, it already has existed now for 20 years. With Gray's, we got a second integrated variable that is observed. And uh, also a variable that is very suitable for global hydrologic model because of its large footprint. So I will explain now a little bit about Gray's total water storage observations or estimates. So I say observe because you will see that there's a lot of um, computation or modeling in a way already 
still in between. So what is grace? Um, you see here a picture or a representation here um, that shows uh, that two satellites here are um, going around the Earth in a certain distance, I think it's 250 kilometers, and all the time the distance between those, these two satellites is measured. And then when the satellite goes over this one, for example, it goes over an area with a larger mass below it, it will change the distance. And this changing of distance is then used by geodesists to compute the gravity field of the Earth. And the great thing is it's the gravity field of the Earth, how it is changing every single month, because it goes, I mean, they have a certain track here, orbit track, and for each month, it can be integrated to come up with an estimate of what is the water storage under, I mean, on Earth, but also with a certain spatial resolution, but how it, does it change from month to month? So these are the GRACE twin satellites. And um, now the gravity field is dominated by ma water mass variations over the land. And uh, I mean, this is not the same as the gravity change. So in order to, to, uh, to derive those water mass variations over the continents, one has to take into account the tides, the ocean, water mass variations, the atmospheric water mass variations, and also the impact of uh, glacial isostatic uplift. So geodesists take that all into account with certain approaches and models, and then comes out total water storage anomaly over the continent. And it is an anomaly because nobody can measure the total mass, of course, of water or anything. You can only put a, a, a reference period like 2004 to 2010, and then Grace can tell you the differences, the anomaly with respect to this. Well, there are two approaches um, geodesists do to derive Gray's total water surge anomaly. These are spherical harmonics or mass counts. Both are equally valid approaches of doing that. Now, what you have to take into account is when you're interested in using TWSA, you can easily find it in the internet, for example, CSR, provides mass cons with a spatial resolution of 0 0.25 degrees. So that's like 25 kilometers. And uh, well, they give you this high resolution data. It's high resolution. But in reality, due to the very large footprint of GRACE, because gravity is a global thing, um, GRACE total water storage anomaly should not be evaluated for regions of less than 200,000 square kilometers. They're quite large regions with approximately 400 of those 0 0.25 degree grid cells. So don't be misled by this uh, many grid cells that all give you a certain value. If you go on the website of the CSR, of CSR, they will tell you, no, no, don't use it for less for regions with less than 200,000 square kilometers. And why is that so? Um, when we look at, I mean, when Grace um, signal comes into existence, it's because there is the satellite going around the Earth, and there is a certain north-south orientation of the satellite ground tracks, and only in one month they cover more or less the whole Earth. And that leads to a north-south striping with correlated errors, um, particularly for the spheric harmonic solutions, but MASCONS is not that it's that they don't have a problem. So because of that very strong striping, a filtering and smoothing is required, but even with filtering and smoothing, some stripes remain. They have also improved filters, but you see here, this is a rather old publication. Here, this is the gray signal for um, 2000, for two months, a difference of two months in, two, in 2003, so it's like an anomaly, with a filter of, two, of 750 kilometers. So it is smooth, but you still see the stripes. No? And you can use other filters, and now they are um, they have um, filters that are uh, correlate take into account those correlated errors, and they are better than these. But I wanted to show you this to show you that there is still this is what you even get in striping when you do filter. And this is uh, not that this is the truth, but this is the water gap, the same water gap um, representation of total water storage, uh, water storage anomalies, and um, yeah just to show that these stripes are probably not very um, reasonable. But what you also nicely see here is, you see how, I mean, water gap only produces values 
over the continents, of course. We don't produce anything for the ocean, but when we filter our water gap results, these are not the, sorry, I didn't say that. These are not water gap results for half degree grid cells, but already filtered with 750 kilometer filter. And then you see already the signal leaching out into the oceans. And that's the, the point, this leakage, not leaching, the leakage out of a signal into the surrounding areas because of the filtering. No, and this is uh, the general problem, let's say problem of Gray's total water storage anom anomalies. So this filtering is necessary and uh, the filtering, what does it cause? It causes a dampening of the temporal variability. So a strong amplitude, a strong seasonality is dampened. So the seasonality becomes smaller, but also the trends are affected. So and we have, I mean, there are also publications where that is shown. And that is just due to the leakage to the outside and leakage from the outside, depending on the strength of the signal. So it really depends what happens outside the area you're interested in, how it affects this area. And even if we have basins larger than 200,000 square kilometers, there may be still a relevant leakage in the spheric harmonic solutions, according to Watkins et al. 2015, depending on the surrounding mass variations. So because of that, because it depends on the surrounding mass variations, which are uncertain too, there is no optimal way for leakage correction, neither so-called data-driven leakage correction, where only some information from GRACE is used and so on, or hydrological model-driven um, leakage corrections, where you take information from hydrologic models and take them into account when you do leakage corrections. So, um, what do we do with this information as hydrologists? So I have worked with uh, geodesists since 2005 or so, but geodesists are also rather reluctant to really say, oh, what should we do? So what can you do? You can use mass cons because they're easiest to handle. So I think I would suggest just maybe use mass cons to start with. So there are the CSR mass cons available and they say that this they're purely derived, purely taken. So they did this mass con solution only based on grace information to derive mass cons with a spatial resolution of one degree, which they then also downscale at to, to 0 0.25 degrees, as I said before. And then there are these alternative providers, JPL mass cons. They use the temporal variability of geophysical models, such as GLS NOAA, to derive three degree mass cons. And when you talk to mass con providers, they assume that they have solved or at least greatly reduced the leakage problem of the spherical harmonic solutions. However, when you talk, at least when I talk to the geodesists I know, they are more in favor of spherical harmonic solutions and say mass cons, well, they just look prettier. Okay. So another option then is to collaborate with geodesists to get total. Um, um, water storage anomalies, that was wrong, total water storage anomalies for the specific spatial units you're interested in, like your river basin or your area. And then they can provide you, but they need to do it from spherical solutions um, for this spatial unit, they can give, provide you time series of um, total water storage anomalies. And they can also do that give, using different um, primary solutions from different processing centers, because all, every processing center does a little different, and then they can also use different filtering methods and so on. Now you may ask, so what? why on earth should I work with geodesists um, to get these SH solutions? Well, the advantage is that at least those people we collaborate with, they also provide observation uncertainty and des estimates. So as far as I know for mass cons, you can only get the value, but no uncertainty information. Well, there are um, geodesists and solutions where they also provide um, uncertainty estimates. However, when you look at the uncertainty estimates of the solution providers, they can be very different. So I want to show you um, first now how different are different GRACE products. And uh, what you see here is in yellow, it's not a GRACE product, it's just water gap, our global model. And what we see is total water storage anomaly uh, for the Mississippi River Basin. 
between 2003 and 2019. So yellow is just our model. So we wanted to see how different is it from um, Gray's total water storage anomaly. And then in dark, Bonn stands for our colleagues who provided that solution, Stuttgart also other colleagues and other colleagues. And the difference is that Stuttgart and Alborg, they tried some a leakage correction. So they do leakage correction, data-driven leakage correction, Bonn does not. And then they're in red, they are the CSR mass comps. Now, when you look at this, so yellow is our model, but those four colors, they are, so to say, supposed to be the grays, TWSA. And you do see some differences between the colors not only between the yellow, but of course our model is different, so we could learn something then about the observations. But what you notice is here that after 2011, I would say, um, well, first of all, Grace is not available anymore for all the time periods, for all the months. Here is then, this is here's Grace follow on starting in mid 2018. There's a big hole here. Then Alborg has tried to do something in between, but I think very obviously that doesn't work. All of a sudden they have a very small summer um, low TWSA value, while water gap tells us, okay, that's not less than the summers before. But you notice that already here in that period, those um, solutions differ quite a bit and here. So um, what we, we wanted to find out when we calibrate or validate our model, so I mean, what solution should we look at? And uh, Bonn people, for example, they do provide also an uncertainty estimate that we thought, well, maybe that is good enough to see the uncertainty. So we evaluated for 148 drainage basins larger than 200,000 square kilometer, um, dif the different grace products. And what you see here are these 148 drainage basins, and we define them as being upstream of a streamflow gauging station that we also use in our normal standard calibration. So Mohammed Hosseini did the big work to look through all these, um, to aggregate it over all these uh, basins and to look at them. And uh, I mean, every basin is different, I can tell you that, but there's something general that we would like to point out. So what you see here is just for an individual basin. This is here, the Red River Basin in Canada. Um, what you see here on the top is um, we show the Aalborg uncertainty, which is the uncertainty that comes from what they do as leakage correction. So a rather large um, um, uncertainty range sometimes. And this is the same value, but here we show the Bonn solutions. And we already use the three sigma, so three standard deviation. And uh, what you see here is that, I mean, you do have, in particular, again, after 2011, I mean, the uncertainty, the, 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 the different gray solutions can be quite outside, even of a three sigma. Um, but before, maybe three sigma was not such a bad estimate, but behind, after that, not anymore. And then this is the gray's follow on period. And I have read, I had read before that I mean you don't have to correct anything in between uh, grace and grace follow on, but at least for a few basins or many basins we find that there is this offset between I mean these colored things. I mean everything except yellow is supposed to be the same thing grace TWSA. So this is not so extreme in every single basin, but it can be. And um, when we look at another basin, the Nelson, just this is just an outlier, I would say, but still, this is the Nelson Basin, also in Canada. And there, the one of the solutions, the Bond solution, does something totally different, while the rest and also water gap stay up here. And then also a very interesting thing here is that what you see here is that the mass cons, so red is mass con, yellow is water gap they stay more or less at the same level. And I mean, this water gap in the mass con is not so different. I mean, here it's also a little different. And then the other, the spheric harmonic solutions, they dive down. And um, what, what may be, but it's not totally clear to me, is that um, you see here, this is the, the, the upper Yukon here. And so this is the Yukon basin. And here down there, you see glacierized grid cells. So everything that is blue, they're grid cells with glaciers. 
and where we are up here. And what you can imagine is that maybe the mascons avoid the leakage from the glacier loss south of the Yukon, uh, while the because they try to concentrate the mass in certain um, mass cons. Mass con is for, stands for mass concentration. While um, while uh, water gap anyway doesn't have a glacier, so we cannot cannot see the mass loss of the glacier, and um, that might be a reason um, why mass cons could be more successful, so to say, in um, avoiding that glacier mass losses leak into grid cells and, and areas uh, far away from glaciers, which they do if you don't care, take very good care of it. Okay, so I've told you a little bit now what uh, the quality or the problems of uh, GRACE observations, in inverted commas, I would say, independent estimates, but of course it's better than a model. It's more observing the earth for sure than we can do with our model, but you can see that it's a lot clear where our model should go to. I mean, what is, so to say, really the best estimate of total water storage anomaly, at least um, outside of the period and um, let's say, or let's say after 2011 in particular, but also before. So, but still, this is more like on the, on the negative side, but of course we can still use it. I mean, still, but here I will show you how we use GRACE to total water storage anomaly for testing and validating water gap. Okay, the first one again is not a success story because uh, in this study, we tried to find out if GRACE is useful for estimating uh, where human water abstractions occur. And human water abstractions lead to a change in the seasonality of total water storage anomaly, because for example, they will take out uh, water for irrigation in the dry season, and then uh, means it out from the groundwater and then put it into surface water. And that means that in the dry season, you get less of a groundwater storage as compared to no groundwater abstraction. And so the amplitude would, for example, increase the seasonal amplitude of a detrended. However, because of the leakage problem, as I said, you need to smooth um, any output. So, I mean, what a grace automatically smooths. And so what we did here, this is the change in um, the leakage, in the change in the seasonal amplitudes due to human water use as compared to a naturalized run, naturalized run without human water use. And uh, you see here all the grid cells where they have the seasonal amplitude is decreased and in blue where the seasonal amplitude is increased due to human water use. But this is at the half degree grid cell um, resolution. But then when you smooth it, with a filter that is now generally used for spheric harmonics, the so-called DDK3 filter, then this signal is smoothed out to what you see here. And these are very small changes here only, more or less minus to plus five millimeter. And that cannot be seen by GRACE anymore. So we need to, uh, we needed to uh, conclude that changes in seasonal total water storage anomaly due to human water abstractions are not seen by GRACE due to the low spatial resolution of GRACE. That is the need to filter. So, so it's not possible to benefit from, gray, from GRACE for quantifying human water abstractions unless they lead to long-term trends in total water storage anomaly. And long-term trends come from groundwater depletion or also depletion of surface water bodies like Lake Ara, like Urumia. But then of course, if we have again more water maybe for yeah, you could also have, of course, positive trends due to increase in precipitation. So that can be seen in water gap, but we cannot see the impact of human water extraction on seasonal total water storage anomaly, which is a pity because that is a dominating um, feature outside of uh, groundwater depletion areas. Then um, we, we participated in a study by Bridget Kenlon et al, where it was about the validation of TWSA trends as simulated by water gap and other global hydrological models by uh, GRACE. Oh. And um, Bridget Kenlon and colleagues, we compared um, the trends in land water storage from several global models, 486 river basins. And um, I just want to give you a glimpse of what we can learn from that, that in uh, dry basins like the Nile, 
Here's the knife. The, so she used uh, three different gray solutions, two mass cons and one spheric harmonic product. And then for the knife, for example, the gray solution tilted in the trend between minus four to plus 14 uh, cubic kilometers per year and the models minus six to plus three. So the same amount of uncertainty, I would say. Uh, however, for the Amazon, which are very, which has a very strong signal, the gray solutions are very similar. So a positive trend here. Of course, the cubic kilometer trend is so high, also because Grace is such. I mean, Amazon is such a large base with such a lot of water. But then the models they're very different. So I mean, the models vary from minus seventy one to eleven cubic kilometers per year. Okay, water gap is eleven, but still much smaller than here. So for large basins with a lot of water and a lot of water mass variation, I mean, Grace is definitely able to better see what is really happening as compared to models, particularly in the water gap. And we are struggling with poor climate input data and no, climate, no hydrology model can work well if the input data, the climate input data are not good. So what we concluded from what for water gap was that, yeah, um, we do not have enough um, temporal variability in our model mainly due to insufficient maximum soil water storage. And, uh, but we also see that we really depend on climate data. And um, what we also found is that often our models underestimate any trends, but also negative trends, but then we don't know why, because it could be due to underestimation of groundwater recharge, but it could also be due to overestimation of groundwater abstractions. And I just want to show you for three basins what came out of the study. So in black here, you have the observations for the Amazon here with the uncertainty. So it's nothing. And then just this blue dotted, this is water gap. These are the other models. And you see here that we do not have enough uh, variability in particular here. No? So the water storage goes up, but none of the models I mean, reflects it. I mean, we, we don't at least don't go down, but anyway. And then also in the Arkansas, I mean, um, there's just the models can learn a lot from it because here also they they differ a lot. And the Euphrates in Iraq, um, here is a very uh, well-known, I think very well-known thing is that there was a really strong drought in 2008 and uh, in this Western Asian region. And it seems that then uh, they started to build a lot of groundwater wells. And then what, that's why the total water storage normally stayed low with, because the groundwater was low and never went up again. But like in our hydrological model, we don't, we, can, we don't know about that. So in our model, the fraction of groundwater use always stays the same. And so we cannot model that. So a lot of it, a lot of can be learned from GRACE for sure. We also used water gap. Uh, we also used to validate water gap output at the global scale in the sense that averaging the whole total water storage anomalies or the mass changes over the whole continents of the Earth, so that we can say how large is the contribution of land water storage changes to global sea level rise. So what we found out with our model was that um, there is over the period since 2003, there is a water mass gain of the oceans due to the continents, because mainly due to groundwater depletion, there was a continental water loss. And so the water that is not any in the groundwater anymore has to be in the ocean. And this makes up about 10% of sea level rise. Okay, that's our model results. And we can validate them by comparing it to the grays Again, globally averaged over all land areas, except Antarctica and Greenland. And we also, in this study, we could uh, add the, the, the glacier uh, storage to it, because we uh, included as input to water gap the output of a global glacier model, GGM, by Ben Marzeon. And then if we add that into, to our normal model, this is then the pink line, and, in, and grace is the dark line, going down like that, then you see that we are quite able to um, estimate the decline in uh, global water storage on all land masses of the Earth. That then has led to an increase in the water mass in the oceans. And I think it's also pretty surprising. It was surprising for me, I must say. We average over 
I mean, 67,000 grid cells or 60,000 grid cells. And then we do get the seasonality quite right, which is uh, quite amazing. So seasonality, phase, and trend lead, I mean, have an overall, let's say, good fit, average over all the continents. Okay, that was just testing and validating the model. Then uh, tuning water gap, we did this in one aspect. We adjusted the computation of irrigation water use by looking at not only, but partially at grace derived total water storage and groundwater depletion from other studies. And when we, when we took these other studies and grace based uh, studies and then compared them to our total water storage anomalies from water gap, we found that it is better instead of assuming that farmers irrigate optimally with the, with the amount of water that would lead to optimal plant growth, that in groundwater depletion areas, if we assume that they only have 70% 70, 70 of optimal water use, then we get a better fit to the groundwater depletion. That's a very rough thing, but uh, that's the example for uh, tuning water gap and tuning some assumptions in the model. And then I come to the calibration. So calibration in the sense that we estimate parameters for basins based on out, based on observations of uh, multiple variables. And uh, the first study was done not at the global scale, but for one relatively small basin, the Lake Urumia Basin in Iran, by uh, Mohammed Hosseini Mogari et al. 2020 in Hess. And um, he used a number of remote sensing and in situ data to calibrate water gap. And um, the remote sensing data included the annual time series of irrigated area estimated from MODIS, but also monthly grace total water storage anomalies. And then the in situ data included stream flow, groundwater levels, some water use data. Yeah. And um, on the right hand side, what you see here, this is the total water storage anomaly on top of the Lake Urumia Basin between 2003 and 2013. And in, well, this is the presentation up here, but then it observed is the gray line. Um, pink is our standard water gap with our standard calibration just against the stream flow. And what you see is in orange, what is achieved by just having remote sensing data, which are available worldwide, um, that is achieves then um, total water storage normally just works much better here, no? So with this calibration against uh, also total water storage anomaly in MODIS irrigated areas, we get a better fit to total water storage, storage anomaly. Great, but when we here look at the inflow into the Lake Urumia, then this is the standard. And then we, when we calibrate against uh, those remote sensing data, we get better, but re the reality is even lower. And to that, and we only get it right if we, in addition, use in situ data like the stream flow data. No, so total water storage anomaly is not a, enough to get that right. And then if groundwater storage anomaly here. When we use this information on um, groundwater levels, that was necessary to get um, to get that right. So also total water storage anomaly didn't help too much here. And uh, this is the lake storage in the Lake Urumia. Well, here it did help quite a bit, the total water storage anomaly, when we compare to these two, but still it was better to have also in situ data. So grace total water storage helps, but I mean, the result is that I would say we all, I mean, if you only have total water storage anomaly and not stream flow or other things, that it's hard. It's getting better maybe, but it's not so easy. So the last, and now we go almost to the last study. Um, we now went to, um, it's in, in the framework of a large project here where we tried out three different calibration methods to estimate model parameters in the global hydrological model water gap. What we want to achieve is on the one hand to reduce the uncertainty of output variables by model calibration, but also to quantify um, the uncertainty, how large it is. And uh, I will not go into details what these calibration methods are, 
but the Pareto optimal calibration with a search algorithm is more or less a classical um, calibration. The generalized likelihood uncertainty estimation is good for estimating the whole range of possibilities. And the ensemble Kalman filter is an approach that is used, uh, for example, by in data assimilation. But it, here we also tried it for estimation of parameters. And what what for us now is oh, sorry. What for us is um, relevant here is for you to see. We are here in the Missouri River Basin. This is this part of the Mississippi Basin. And this is the nesatative efficiency for stream flow. And down here is the nesatative efficiency for total water storage anomaly. And each point that you see is one parameter set of, let's say, 10 different parameters. And one ensemble, one parameter set is one point. So we did these runs with 20,000 different parameter. I mean, different um, parameter sets. And what you see here, just look look at the yellow curve here. This is per the Pareto optimal solutions. That means um, this shows a little bit the trade-offs between an optimal fit to total water storage anomaly. So, so at that point, um, you get the optimal fit. You get a very good fit to stream flow with an assertive efficiency of 0.8. But then uh, your nesthetic efficiency for total water storage anomaly is only 0 0.5. And the other way around, if you get a high value for total water storage anomaly uh, fit, then your nesthetic efficiency for stream flow goes down. And then when you take into account the uncertainty of the observations, that's what we did here when we derived those dark gray curves, then you even get many more ensemble members that give uh, an equally good fit in a way that if you, if you don't want to wait which fit you prefer or which is more important to you, total water storage anomaly or stream flow. So the main results of this study were that with this multivariate calibration against stream flow and total water storage, it were only actually two variables, they somehow Im somewhat improved the fit to stream flow and more so to total water storage anomaly as compared to the standard water gap calibration in most basins. And that was mainly due to improved correlation. So the, the, the variation, the variability, and the bias did not improve much. But what was great, we do, with this, we do not need any more uh, correction factors. And in the lower Mississippi basin, the calibrated model no longer simulates a wrong decline in TWSA trend. So that's the good part, but major discrepancies remain. And obviously that must have to do with the model structure or maybe the input. For example, in our model, rivers cannot lose water to the groundwater, which is very typical for hydrological models. But particularly in the dry areas in the Western Mississippi Basin, that is the case. Rivers do lose water uh, to the groundwater. And anyway, we cannot find uh, a good parameter set because there are a large number of parameter sets that lead to an equally good fit to observations, given particularly observation uncertainty. And we find strong trade-offs between a good fit of stream flow and total water storage anomaly, not in all basins. So in the easy basins, the humid basins, that's not so strong. Uh, or the humid basins that don't have enough, they don't have many reservoirs and then that, that don't have many small wetlands. There we don't have this trade-offs, but in the amid, in the arid regions, semi-arid regions, we do have that, and uh, also in the northern parts of the Mississippi Basin, where there are very many small wetlands, and nobody really knows where those wetlands are and how they work. Now, what we also found is we also said, okay, if we would only have raised total water storage anomaly <laughs> for calibrating the model. We found that if we try to calibrate against Gray's total water storage anomaly, in most cases, it leads to a degradation of the fit to stream flow, even as compared to the uncalibrated model. So we have a degradation two out of five sub-basins, even not compared to our standard um, 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 calibration, but uncalibrated model. So in those basins or these areas where we don't have uh, stream flow observations, which are many, when we use GRACE, that might not be a good idea. It might lead to a worse fit to stream flow, but then we don't know. 
And this is this result is in line with other studies, but I think it has not been made clear very much. So the final thing that we are to start now is we still want to do a global scale calibration of water gap using the GRACE total water source anomaly, stream flow, and mode of snow cover. And uh, I cannot show you any results there, but I just wanted to show you here the difficulty when you want to have on the one hand, total water storage anomaly as your uh, calibration objective, and on the other hand, also uh, stream flow and snow cover. Because for stream flow and snow cover, we could use, for example, those 1509 small basins that you see here, the very small basins in the light gray lines. But then you have the larger basins in turquoise with the darker outlines. These are the, the 148 basins that are larger than 200,000 square kilometers. And then you have to find um, a way to bring these two spatial scales together. And that's how we plan to do it so that we will, in those large basins, we will not do, we will take into account all the stream flows in there, but not have special calibration units for just the small stream flow units. Conclusions of my task, of my talk. Gray soil water storage anomaly adds valuable large scale and integrated information to the large scale and integrative information provided by streamflow observations, which different from GRAYS lack global coverage. You know? So that's the value of GRAYS, global coverage. And we find that GRAYS total water storage anomaly can be used well to validate, tune, and calibrate global hydrologic models that simulate at least almost all relevant water storage compartments, as well as water use and man made reservoirs but not for seasonal things. And GRACE cannot be used for bases smaller than approximately 200,000 square kilometers. And it's approximately, I mean, these 200,000 square kilometers is also what is on the CSR website. And many people say, but some people say maybe 100,000. So it's not, no, this is not so fixed. And even for these large bases, different GRACE products may differ relevantly for various reasons. And one may be, I mean, it's also still leakage there. And what I really would like to be I would like to point out to be for you to be careful about it because there's so many papers out on grace trends. So how much water was lost in Germany and how much water was lost in the Central Valley and so on. And trends, I think they're always very tricky anyway, but I think grace trends are particularly uncertain. And one reason being the strong impact of leakage on trends. So we found that in 2000, our 2014 study already, but uh, very recently, um, there was a study by my colleague Andreas Güntner from uh, the GFZ in, in, in Potsdam. GFZ is also the center where they, uh, where they produce GRACE uh, solutions. And uh, there was a study or more or less like a press release based on JPL uh, mass cons that Germany has lost so much water over the last 30 years. And then Günther et al. looked at these results and they used spheric harmonic solutions to estimate the same thing. And they took into account that there is, when you look at all of Germany, that is, there is a strong leakage from the Alpine glaciers in Switzerland and Austria. So because there has been such a strong decline in glacier storage, that decline leaks into Germany. So even if, I mean, Germany is large as compared to Austria and Switzerland, but still the leakage is very strong. So when they took into account the leakage, then uh, they found that the JPL mass cons overestimated the water loss in Germany by a factor of two to three. And I think that is a lot. And so please be careful with any trend estimates uh, based on grace. And uh, finally, the grace total water storage anomaly estimates provided by grace providers are in most cases much smaller than the differences between the different grace products of different providers. So I think that should also tell you that those um, error estimates, they're not uh, perfect, I would say. Of course, one would say we have no error estimates for stream flow. So that's the other thing. Yeah, and finally, it is advisable to always use more than one great product for model validation and calibration. So thank you very much for your attention.